If you had told me a few years ago that one day I would be recommending a Cadillac SUV over a Volvo, an Audi, or a BMW, I would have assumed you were talking about someone that really wanted a big SUV because there's no answer to Cadillac's Escalade in the European lineups. If you had told me I would be recommending a Cadillac SUV over those competitors because of its interior, I would have said you're crazy. But that day has finally arrived. This is the 2024 Cadillac XT4. It's the answer to the XC40, the Q3, and the BMW X1. And especially when it comes to interior refinement, this is better than all three of those options. Before we get to the interior, let's talk about the design, what has changed and what hasn't changed, and hopefully we'll be able to do that before it starts snowing, which is expected a little bit later in the afternoon. The exterior refresh is relatively minor for 2024, and I think that's okay because the X-T4 has always been one of my favorites in this segment as far as design. Whether you want to call it art and science or whatever Cadillac is calling their new design language, I dig it. I like the sharp angles. I like this sort of waterfall daytime running lamp theme. We have full LED headlights, of course, here, and the distinctive Cadillac grille and logo up front. It's clean. It's not as uh, boring, I guess you'd say, as some of the European options, but it's not quite as adventurous as Lexus, and I think that's actually a good thing for the Cadillac. Before we get to the rest of the X-T4, we should talk a little bit about the competition. This starts just under $38,000, so price-wise, it's right in line with the X-C40, the Q3, the X1, etc. It's actually less expensive than the Volvo, the BMW, or the Mercedes. It's right about the same entry point as the Audi Q3, and a little bit more expensive than the Lexus UX, but the UX kind of isn't the same sort of thing as this. What confuses some shoppers and some reviewers, I would say, is that Cadillac has generally positioned their vehicles as kind of segment tweeners, where they tend to be a little bit larger or a little bit smaller than some of the competition, and that includes the X-T4. With an overall length coming in at 181 inches, the X-T4 is on the long side of the segment, but it's not the longest. That would actually be the Mercedes-Benz GLB. Mercedes and BMW field two entries in this segment. Mercedes has the GLB and the GLA, sort of the sporty hatchback rather than the more upright SUV like the GLB. And then we have the BMW X1 and X2, of course. You could consider them both competition to this. The Volvo XC40 is notably shorter than this, like the BMW X1 is. They're about four inches shorter or so. But the bulk of the difference in terms of dimensions actually happens with the bumper overhangs, both front and rear. So as far as interior dimensions go, they're actually all right about the same size. If you hadn't already noticed, Cadillac loves tall taillights. Even though this is the smallest SUV in the lineup, it has a pretty big lamp here. It is 32 inches from top to bottom, and it's certainly a distinctive love it or hate it design. I think it works with the design of the X-T4, but I'd love to know what you think down there. Am I crazy? We have full LED modules here, brake lights and turn signals, the backup light that's front and center or back and center, I guess you could say right there at the bottom of the bumper. We have twin exhaust tips at the bottom there. Those actually are real exhaust tips, not fake ones like we find in some of the competition. And then over here, we find the 350T badging, which I do find a little peculiar. Cadillac takes the torque output of the engine in newton meters, not pound feet, which is more common in North America, and then they round that up to 50. Why newton meters? Well, because it makes a bigger number. What's the number in pound feet? I'm glad you asked. It's 258. That's certainly a little less impressive than 350, and that's exactly why Cadillac does it that way. Horsepower, 235 from a two liter four cylinder turbo. The displacement, horsepower, and torque figures are pretty similar to most of the competition's base engine offerings. However, we don't find an optional engine in the X-T4, and you do in some of those European competitors. I don't really find that to be a problem because Cadillac has kept pricing on the X-T4 fairly low, so they really don't have any models that get up there into the stratosphere like you can find in the GLA or GLB. Those get fantastically expensive. And interestingly, even though they get more expensive, none of them is going to have an all-wheel drive system as interesting as the one in the X-T4. There are two reasons for that. One good and one somewhat controversial. The controversial one is this is always going to disable the rear axle when you hit the start button. So every time you turn it on, it's going to be a front-wheel drive vehicle. You have to engage all-wheel drive via the various drive modes in the center console. That's going to send power to the rear axle where we find a twin-clutch torque vectoring unit. That's the good interesting part. This is the only entry in this segment that offers rear torque vectoring outside of an Acura RDX, which kind of isn't really in this segment. That's really playing with the Cadillac X-T5. 
The twin clutch unit doesn't just give this torque vectoring functionality, it also gives it limited slip functionality. So if you live in a place that you get a lot of snow, a lot of ice, etc., this is going to feel more sure-footed because of that mechanical capability of the rear axle, as long as you have engaged the right drive mode. The other downside here, no hybrid system, no plug-in hybrid system, obviously no EV version is offered in the X-T4 at this time, but Cadillac does have a few EVs for you to choose from if you're interested. When it comes to active driver assistance tech, Cadillac does not put quite as much on the X-T4 as we find standard on the average Lexus or Acura. For instance, features like adaptive cruise control, that's not only optional on the X-T4, you can't get it on the base model. You have to get up to the next trim, then add an $1,825 option package. Also, even though autonomous emergency braking is standard on the X-T4, it's not as feature rich as the AEB system on this particular model because this one has the adaptive cruise control package on it. So it's gonna work over a broader range of different situations and it's gonna better detect pedestrians, cyclists, things like that. Also on this model is the 360 degree camera, the heads up display, and the optional rear autonomous emergency braking. One interesting twist, no version is gonna have front parking sensors, but of course we have that forward view camera. On Facebook, a number of you were asking about front seat comfort. Has the seat design changed? Are they more comfortable than they were before? The short answer is no. The core seat design remains the same. However, for my body shape at six feet tall, I actually find these seats to be quite comfortable. The only thing I would change if I could would be a seat cushion extension or perhaps a slightly longer seat bottom cushion, just because I would find that a bit more supportive. But on longer car trips, I found these great. I do like the fact that we have four-way adjustable lumbar support and the seat design is identical on the passenger side. So if you're looking at something like a Lexus UX and you'd like four-way lumbar for your front passenger, this is gonna be a great upgrade. Also on this model, we have the available front seat massage. It basically just inflates and deflates the bolsters back there for the four-way adjustable lumbar support. We also have a powered memory-linked tilt telescopic steering column, which is a feature you don't really find on most of the competition. On the other hand, keep in mind, this is a relatively small vehicle. So if you're taller than I am, you will logically find yourself sitting kind of right next to this pillar, and that does mean that sideways visibility can get a little bit tricky. On the other hand, the front seat tracks certainly move further rearward than something like the Lexus UX, definitely making this more comfortable for taller people. With just under 80 inches of combined legroom, the X-T4 has one of the roomiest back seats in this segment. It's pretty obvious. With this front seat adjusted for me, I have maybe about four or five inches of legroom left. This is obviously not gonna compete with something like a Lexus RX or anything like that, but over here on this side with the front passenger seat all the way back at its tracks, I still have about two inches of legroom left and plenty of headroom. Although with the power moonroof option, my hair is brushing the ceiling. So some of those upright and box entries like a Volvo XC40, they're gonna give you a bit more room. Something sleeker and sexier like the C40, that's gonna give you less room. Also a BMW X2 there. We have a fold down armrest for the rear seat passengers and 60-40 rather than 40-20-40 folding rear seats like you do find in some of the European competition. And the rear seats don't recline. They just are up or they're down. Passengers in the back get air vents in the center console. This model has heated rear seats, and then we get USB charge-only ports for the rear passengers as well. Thanks to the generous amount of legroom, this is actually one of the few entries in this segment that could easily accommodate a rear-facing infant seat like this one behind a six-foot tall driver. However, depending on your driving position, things could get a little bit tighter if you wanted to put one of those larger rear-facing convertible seats back here. Now, even though things are pretty roomy back here for child seats, these latch anchors are my least favorite kind because you have to kind of reach in there between that upholstery and actually find that latch anchor inside there. That's part of why we find the little icon down there on the seat bottom cushion. That certainly makes it not only harder to fish around for them, but it also means that your upholstery gets kind of weird creases on it if you have a child seat latch anchored uh, for any period of time. And it's just gonna make it harder for you to change seats around if you have to move from vehicle to vehicle. On the other hand, we have a shoulder belt that comes out of the seat back itself rather than out of the ceiling. That's definitely a more practical touch. Behind the power hatch, we find 22 and a half cubic feet of cargo space. That's about average for this segment. One thing to know, however, that's not average is the height of the hatch. It's quite low. And even at its highest height there, I can actually hit my head if I come in right there like that. That's something that taller drivers should definitely be aware of, especially since the hatch is pretty prominent here. And I could see myself accidentally bashing my head on that if I wasn't careful. Another thing to know, we don't have a roller style cargo cover. This is a hard variety. It's not my favorite, but it's not one of those funky dished curvy seashell kind of things. It's actually nice and flat. So you can just pop it here on the floor 
if you needed to out of the way, but it's not gonna go in right like that. You actually have to put it in this way, and that's only gonna work, of course, if the rear seats are folded. In my 24 inch roller bag test, I was able to get four bags back here, which is definitely a solid showing. And under the floor, we have room to put a spare tire if you wanted to, but in this model, we just have the can of fix a flat and a little bit of extra storage space. I think this storage space is actually a little bit wasted because check out the shape. We get this donut in the middle, we get these little bins on the side. They could have put this off to one side and really given us a more practical storage area. That's really the only misstep back here. I think I'd rather have a spare though. On the inside, let's start with the biggest change first, and that has to be this absolutely enormous 33-inch screen on the dashboard. This has basically been borrowed out of the Cadillac Lyric, and it's not multiple screens like we find in a Mercedes or a Hyundai or something like that. So spanning all the way from this corner all the way over to that side, that is one enormous screen. Over here, we have the infotainment side of things. You can see that Apple CarPlay doesn't occupy quite the entire screen. It just takes up that little bit right there. And then we have the buttons down here for various system functions. So things like the Google Podcast, Google News, the native mapping system, the assistant setup, etc. It is worth noting that the native mapping interface actually uses that entire curved portion of the screen. And then over here, we have the instrument cluster portion, which does feature map projection from your smartphone. So you can use smartphone mapping or the native Google mapping. You could also opt for sort of a regular gauge layout right there. And then on this side of the screen, we have touch controls. So the entire screen is one enormous LCD touch control. You can change the various display designs there. You can also go through your trip computer right there, or you can adjust the heads up display with those touch controls over there on that side. The big screen was not just grafted onto the dashboard as it was. They actually redesigned the entire upper portion of the dash to really dress things up and make it integrate better. One of the things I noticed immediately is this embroidery work right over here on the dashboard. These are details we don't find in most of the competition. And I have to say that this dashboard taken as a whole or piece by piece is just nicer than the dashboard we find in the BMW, the Audi, the Volvo, etc. And there's a surprising amount of attention to detail from the stitched upper section of the dashboard to the stitched cover over the heads up display, not a hard plastic cover like we find in some of the competition to the stitch work that we find here in the center of the dash. We find the sort of piano key controls for the climate control here. We then find buttons down here for the seat heating and seat ventilation. And thankfully, very, very little piano black plastic. Actually, the only piece of piano black is right here around the shifter. Even this little storage area has a stitched cover over it and the center console, that's all stitched as well. Two big cup holders there. That same joystick style shifter we've seen from Caddy for a while. We then have the controller for the infotainment system. It's a touchscreen, of course, so you can choose whether you want to use the controller or not. Then the all important mode button. This is how you enable all wheel drive. If I go back up here to the infotainment system, you can see the various drive modes there. If I click back on that button, we'll cycle through them. So we have off road, we have tour, that's two wheel drive. We then have sport and then we go back to the off-road mode. That's the way you turn on the all-wheel drive system. Now going back over here to this side of the dashboard, you can see that we have the optional audio system there. That's an AKG audio system. So we have the up-level speaker there, soft touch materials on the lower section of the dashboard, sort of a rubbery finish to the glove compartment. It's a relatively small glove compartment, although I was able to fit an 11 inch tablet computer inside. And then moving over to the doors, we find stitched upper section right there real wood trim, which is something that we don't find in all of the competition. They've kept it kind of minimal. Of course, keep in mind the price tag, but it is real wood. And then we find harder plastics lower on the doors. What's also interesting is that if I move around to the back doors, the back door design is exactly the same, including the real wood trim, the stitched upper section, etc. We just get a slightly cheaper looking speaker grill right there in front of the handle. Now, the seats themselves, we have two-way adjustable headrests, the sort of little Cadillac uh, logo right there, or Cadillac little whatever we call that thing. Height adjustable shoulder belts for the driver and front passenger, and then this model has the big dual-pane moonroof. As we see in other Cadillacs, the front seats are relatively wide and the bolstering is fairly minor, so larger folks shouldn't have any trouble sitting here. And then we find very little bolstering on the seat bottom cushion. Again, no seat bottom cushion extension going on there. 
Next to that, we have the center console with a storage area underneath. There's sort of a two tier going on there. We find a big storage well under there, and that's where we find the Qi wireless charging mat. It's worth noting that Apple CarPlay and Android Auto can operate wirelessly or wired, but in this little storage compartment, there's nowhere for you to store your phone if you have it connected via USB. So I just stuck it in that little storage slot right there. Moving back up to the dashboard, we have a three-spoke steering wheel, very similar to other Cadillac models. You'll find paddle shifters on the back of the steering wheel there. Controls for the adaptive cruise control system over here, that's an option. And then over here, we find controls for the infotainment system. Let's start things out a little bit out of order because of the way this all-wheel drive system functions. When it's in two-wheel drive mode, they're not kidding, this is two-wheel drive only. It doesn't really matter how much slip you get on a road surface like this, whether you're on ice or your snow or you're stuck and the wheels are just spinning and spinning and spinning, it's just gonna be a two-wheel drive vehicle until I hit the mode button. It takes a bit to engage, but once it does, it feels pretty much like everything else out there with again, that added twist of a little bit more torque vectoring capability than you'll find in a brake-based system. The torque vectoring is definitely noticeable out on a paved road surface like this, where the X-T4 cuts a corner just notably better than an X-1 or an X-C40, etc. Not quite as nicely as an RDX, and that's because this cannot send as much power to the rear axle without front wheel slip as the RDX. It doesn't have the same sort of acceleration unit as part of the all-wheel drive system, but it still does very, very well. Now, let's get to the numbers. Zero to 60 in this model took seven seconds even. That is on the slow side of the segment. Keep in mind that power output is not quite as aggressive as some. And this two liter four cylinder sounds a little bit throaty or a little bit more gruff, depending on how you want to phrase it. I would say it's a little bit smoother than the Volvo XC40's engine, but not as smooth as the Mercedes, the BMW, or the Audi. 60 to zero, that also was pretty impressive, especially given the fact that it's pretty damp outside, just 110 feet for this to stop from 60 back to zero. When it comes to the handling score, I'm gonna give this model an A+, although obviously it's gonna depend on exactly what you wanna cross shop this against. A top-end X-T4, you could cross shop that against a base X-3 or something like an Acura RDX with super handling all-wheel drive, and they are gonna be a little bit more fun than this. But I do like the combination of capability and just the feel that we find in this. Cadillac has done a really good job tuning the handling and the suspension here, so that way it drives well, it has a nice ride quality to it. Everything is really well done here. And that's something that we also find in Cadillac's rear wheel drive sedans, of course. Now, the thing that's interesting about this segment is that the competition is front wheel drive as well. Whether we're talking about the BMW or the Mercedes, obviously the Volvo and the Audi that have been all uh, front wheel drive for a while, but front wheel drive is not really a problem for the X-T4. It's arguably more of a problem for the X-T5 and X-T6, but for this model, it's actually not a problem. So if you're willing to give Cadillac a shot, I think you're gonna be pleasantly surprised when it comes to both the handling capability and the ride score, which I'm certainly gonna give an A in this model. If you want adaptive dampers, they are available in the X-T4, but I think I would get it without the adaptive dampers like we're driving right here. This doesn't have a lot of body roll. It doesn't have a lot of tip and dive. If I just step on the brake pedal here, it stays nice and level. It doesn't have a lot of lift under acceleration. And I think that they've really done a good job, again, balancing the ride and the handling priorities of the X-T4. This is not gonna be as hardcore as, you know, something like the top-end M performance or M handling package that you can get in the BMW X2, but it's not intending to be either. As far as cabin noise goes, 70 and a half decibels in this cabin is pretty average at 50 miles an hour. I have to admit, I was hoping that Cadillac would make this the quietest entry in the segment, but they chose not to. They chose to just really slot it in there with the rest of the competition. I think that's fine, but I think it was a bit of a missed opportunity because General Motors has definitely proved that they can build really quiet vehicles. The Lyric is impressively quiet out on the road. This, you're certainly gonna hear more of that four cylinder engine noise in the cabin than I might like. Now, as far as fuel economy goes, it's gonna depend on whether or not you're constantly engaging all wheel drive. I could see that if you live in a climate like I do, where there are fun winding roads, there's a lot of rain, there's a lot of moss currently on the roads that you might want the extra security of all wheel drive. That is going to impact your fuel economy. I tried my best to keep it off for the most part this uh, week, but I have been turning it on here and there and I've averaged 23 and a half miles per gallon over a week of mixed driving. That's definitely in keeping with most of the competition. However, there are a few hybrid options out there. Really only from Lexus, of course, in this particular segment, the Lexus UX, 
maybe you could consider the Lexus NX as a hybrid. Obviously, there's the Lincoln Corsair as well, but then we start getting a little bit out of the segment that the price tag of this model is really playing in. With all that in mind, let's talk about the pricing because the X-T4 is actually a pretty good deal. And as we roll through the prices, it's important to remember that you're likely gonna get a better deal on the X-T4 than on any of those other options on the dealer lot because there are incentives available for the X-T4 right away. All right, now it's time to do the tricky thing of pricing and comparisons with the X-T4 because what does it really compete against? The tweener status of the X-T4, at least in some folks' minds, make this confusing, but when you really look at the interior dimensions and the pricing, it's very clearly a subcompact. And by that I mean direct competitor to the XC40, which is the best seller in this segment. Yep, you heard that right. Volvo is actually the best seller here. And the Lincoln Corsair, which is number two, like, depending on exactly where you want to put the Corsair, of course. The Cadillac is number three. This is actually the segment where Cadillac is the third best seller outside of the full-size SUV segment, of course. Then we have the BMW X1, and the rest of them all filter out below that. This sort of makes sense when you look at the pricing of the X-T4, though, because the X-T4 spans from $38,340 on up to $53,415, and that is basically the same price range as everyone else. The X-T40 starts from $42,000 or so to about the same top end, a little bit more expensive. The Corsair gets more expensive, but there's also a plug-in hybrid on that model. BMW has a secondary engine choice, 313 horsepower there. That's why it gets up to 61,000. But comparably equipped, these are all pretty close to one another. So without further ado, let's just dive right into the competitors here. First, obviously, is that XC40. The XC40 has been a hot seller because, honestly, it's really good looking. Not just on the outside, but on the inside as well. I like the Swedish minimalism, and I think that Volvo's interior and exterior design priorities worked really well with the XC40 because Volvo has been kind of the scrappy, you know, underdog in the European auto industry for a while. And that has meant that they've had to make some strategic decisions about how to price their products and try and appear as the value alternative to the German brands. In this segment, they're still doing that, but they don't have the disadvantage that they have compared to the other German options in the other segments. So when you look at an XC60 or an XC90, they're competing against rear wheel drive Germans with a lot of power and lots of luxury options, etc. In this segment, there's no rear wheel drive option. So it makes it an awful lot easier for the XC40 not only to fit in, but also to outsell those German options. We get relatively similar power to the Cadillac, 247 horsepower from the two liter four cylinder engine, an eight speed automatic transmission there. And there are a number of extra features on the XC40 that you'll notice aren't available on some of the competition. And that mainly, I think, has to do with the sales volume. This uh, really surprised everybody coming out of the gate selling really strong. And then as it has continued to sell better, like we typically see, Volvo has been able to offer more options. So more paint color options, more different trim levels, etc. I love the fact that we can get pixel headlights in the XC40, etc. as well. Next up, we have the next direct competitor, which is the Lincoln Corsair. And for some folks, this is actually the most direct competitor because, you know, Lincoln meets Cadillac there. The Corsair, it's actually going to be a little bit more expensive, but it does seem like there's some slightly more aggressive deals on the Lincoln dealer lot. It's going to start at $41,030, go on up to $60,225, not including the plug-in hybrid. So the Corsair does get kind of expensive. And I think that's because in the top-end Corsair models, Lincoln is trying to make it a X3 competitor. I don't know if they're managing that, to be perfectly honest, because it's a little small on the inside there. Also, not rear-wheel drive. But, you know, Lincoln has to do them. I do appreciate the fact that the Corsair has Blue Cruise available, and I find the interior very, very comfortable. I think the ride quality is better in the Corsair than in the Cadillac, but handling is better in the Cadillac than in the Corsair. I also think when it simply comes to looks the Cadillac wins. It's better looking on the inside, it's better looking on the outside, and even though I find the interior a bit more comfortable in the Lincoln, I would probably choose the prettier interior over the more comfortable interior because there's nothing uncomfortable about the Cadillac, it's just not quite as comfortable if that makes sense. Next up, we have the BMW X1. I suppose you could also maybe include the BMW X2 in here, although it's worth noting that even those two vehicles combined wouldn't make it the best seller in this segment definitely kind of a mind twist when you think about it that way. The X1 starts at 41495 If you get carried away with options, it's actually a pretty decent deal at 61195 
especially when compared against something like that Corsair, because that $61,000 price point gets you 313 horsepower and a decent number of the BMW typical performance upgrades like upgraded braking, etc., that you normally find on rear wheel drive BMWs sort of scaled down for this small crossover. So obviously no carbon ceramic brakes or really big, big brakes, but we still get nice brake upgrades, some wheel upgrades. You can get, you know, more performance oriented tires on your X1 if you wanted to, etc. The base model produces 241 horsepower from its 2-liter 4-cylinder engine. That's still a pretty healthy number, and performance is definitely solid in this segment. I would say as far as driving dynamics goes, I prefer the X1 over the other entries simply because of the way that BMW has tuned the suspension and the drivetrain to work with one another. But in terms of absolute grip numbers, honestly, with similar tires, it's going to be very much the same as the other competitors here because they're all front-wheel drive based. On the other hand, BMW has by far the best infotainment system in this segment. It has the latest version of iDrive with the big curved two-screen setup in the dashboard. They just ripped it right out of another BMW and jammed it down here into the smaller X1. And I think it's easily the most attractive and the best featured. But number two for me would be the one that we find in the Cadillac. I love the curved screen. I love the design of it, that it really flows into everything. We don't have quite as much screen real estate as we find in the BMW. And I think the BMW software is just a bit more attractive and a bit more feature rich, but Cadillac really has done a lot of work to make their system one of the best. It's definitely better than the one that we find in the Volvo. The Volvo system tends to be kind of plain, also a little bit slow and quirky. Uh, the one in the Corsair, it's definitely plain, even though it has a pretty decently sized screen in the dashboard. And even if we compare its infotainment system to our next competitor, which has to be the Lexus NX, it's definitely clearly in a different league. The Lexus NX, its system just feels really old. Now, is the NX in this segment or not? That's a tricky one. According to Lexus, it's not. According to Cadillac, it's not either. But according to a decent number of you on our Facebook page, it's in this segment. Now, the reason everybody else says it's not is because Lexus has the UX. And Lexus considers that small hatchback the competitor to the X1, the X2, the XC40, etc. But it's kind of a funky hybrid only thing, and it's not quite the same thing as those others. The NX, though, it's kind of oddly sized. It's smaller on the inside and outside than a decent number of options. It's kind of in that same sort of X4 Corsair, what is it really kind of window. Pricing wise, though, the NX is definitely more expensive. And this is where some of the categorization stuff comes in. So $40,605 is where it starts. But that gets you a 200 horsepower engine borrowed from the RAV4, so significantly less power. 55,930 is where just the regular model ends, and that doesn't include the hybrid models or the plug-in hybrid model. The NX gets a decent amount more expensive than the vast majority of these options. Its pricing ladder is actually more similar to something like an XC60 or some of those other options there. It's not quite in the same category. Now that said, I could still see a decent number of people shopping the NX. And if I were cross shopping these two, I would quite simply get the Cadillac. I think it's prettier inside. I think it's prettier outside. You aren't really giving up anything in terms of interior room or interior cargo area, etc. You'll also get more power than you find in the base Lexus because of course you get the turbocharged engine standard in the Cadillac. Admittedly, there's no hybrid in the Cadillac, and I do like the hybrid system in the NX, but you're going to be paying a decent amount more for that hybrid system than the base models that we've been talking about, and you're probably going to get a better deal on the X-T4 on the Cadillac dealer lot. Obviously, on the Lexus, we get classic Lexus resale value and reliability, but keep in mind, a decent number of these vehicles are leased. Depending on the numbers you want to look at, it's somewhere over 50%, so that means that a majority of customers don't necessarily need to worry about resale value or or objectively long-term reliability either, because if you lease it, it just doesn't matter as much. And therefore, the lease rate is going to be more important than either of those factors. And the leases have typically been a little bit lower on the X-T4. The numbers are actually kind of comparable at the moment that we're shooting this video. But again, you're likely going to get a better deal on that Cadillac on dealer lots. Let me know what you think about all that down there in the comment section below. And what would you choose if you were shopping in this segment? I really love the XC40. I think it's an elegant look inside and out. I think it has aged extremely well. But it is not exactly a spring chicken at this point. And I have to admit, that is reason enough for me to take a look at the X-T4. I love the fact that the Corsair has Blue Cruise. It's the only option in this segment with a hands-free driving assistant. But it's going to cost you more than the X-T4. And I don't think that extra price tag is really worth it. So if my money were on the line, 
I would probably get the Cadillac. And that's something that, you know, a few years ago, I didn't think I would ever really say, especially not in this segment. Let me know what you think about that down there in the comment section below. What would your pick be? Did we miss something? And of course, what is the X-T4 to you? Is it subcompact? Is it compact? Is it neither? Uh, what would you be cross-shopping with it? Let me know down there. Find us over at Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, etc. And I'll see all of you later.